so I'm on my way to see Mark Zuckerberg, and I waited this long to say anything because I didn't want my homemates to think I was talking to myself. But I'm going to ride my bike over to campus. I like to ride my bike. This will be interesting. Let's see how many things I can hold at once without dropping anything. Oh, there are a lot of people in our dining hall. Oh, I guess because it's still the morning. There's McGregor. Some people walking ahead of us. Now we're back on campus. Since I'm the only one that has so a ticket. Camera? No, this is oh, my flip actually, cam. Yes, I just noticed. Yeah. I got it from Woot. So that just means I have to do a really good job today. <laughs> but it's between people's heads. <laughs> yeah. Well, so far there's not that much going on right now. I've never seen 26100 look like this. This is one of the big freshman lecture halls. Yeah. 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 Uncomfortable plywood seats. Yep. So comfy. It reminds me of bio lectures freshman year when we could watch the attendance dwindle and dwindle yeah. as the year went on. So it was more like it was almost a, uh, an exponential fall off for a little while. I might have to cut that out of the video. <laughs> oh, I didn't know you were recording. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure most of you know I'm Eric Grimson. I have the honor of being Chancellor here at MIT. And I'm delighted to be able to say that it's my pleasure to welcome to our campus um, three friends from Facebook. Sitting in the audience is, uh, is Jocelyn Goldfein, Director of Engineering Organization. And joining me on stage are Mike Schreffer, Vice President of Engineering. I got close, Mike, on that one. And of course, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO. Please again join me in welcoming them here. was overwhelming. We have 2,600 people who signed up for the lottery and the lucky 500 are here. And they gave me uh, about a thousand questions to ask you. So we're not going to do all thousand, but I thought we would just jump in and talk about some of their questions. Um, I want to put a preface out, which I also warned you is our students are great at asking blunt questions. <laughs> and, and Very true. Entitled, you and Mike are entitled to ignore any of them that you'd like and I'll deal with them later. like blunt questions. <laughs> So why don't we start at the start? Um, what was your inspiration for Facebook, and, and what got you what got you triggered on all of this? Like early. Oh, I just like building stuff. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I was on my way over here this morning, Shrek, we call him Shrek at Facebook. How we were driving over from from our hotel, and I was telling him stories about when I used to go visit MIT when I was at Harvard because I had friends here. And one of the things that I always loved about MIT was, I mean, you guys always hack the dorms, right? In Harvard, everything is like exactly the way they left it, it's like 200 years ago. And, um, and at, at, at MIT, it's like you show up and, you know, there's a website that, that folks in, in the dorm configured so you can see what food is in the refrigerator and what stalls are available in the bathroom. It's like you never get this stuff at Harvard. No. We kept on doing the next step, and then here we are seven or eight years later, and this thing now has 800 million people using it, and the, the question is, why didn't someone else do it? Um, I don't know. I think we just cared for it. Were there places where it just got to the stage where you said, this is just much bigger than I ever expected? Well, there were times that I think we got ahead of ourselves. Right? So I, I started it out here. My roommates joined me. A few other folks joined who I, who I did CS problem sets with. We moved out to uh, Silicon Valley for the summer. At the time, it was just for the summer. And that was largely because I'd worked at Harvard over the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. So I'd been in Cambridge for, um, for almost two years straight and just wanted to go somewhere else. And I figured, you know, all these startups seem to come from Silicon Valley. Wouldn't that be a cool place to spend the summer? I mean, clearly this isn't my startup, but maybe eventually I'll build one and I'll learn something. Mm -hmm. And we ended up staying out there because, you know, it turned out it was really hard to both run and 
grow Facebook and take courses, so I um, didn't do that well my, my sophomore spring. And, um, and then we, so we stayed, and we didn't really think that we were going to stay out there permanently. We just figured it was a temporary thing. The, the, first thing where, where, the first time where I felt like stuff really got ahead of us was when companies started trying to buy Facebook. And um, I, I was really inexperienced, and I didn't know how to deal with that kind of a process. I mean, in retrospect, it turns out you don't want to sell your company. You just should not talk to people about selling your company. Um, that is not going to lead to a, a good place. But um, <laughs> lesson learned. But it, it turns out, so we started um, entertaining these conversations with Yahoo and a, a bunch of others, and they were offering us these insane amounts of money. The kinds of issues you worry about in terms of protecting privacy, but encouraging the kind of wonderful social dynamic that you do. Well, I think that this, in a way, might actually be the core insight of Facebook early on. Is that the mission is to make the world more open and connected, right? So the goal is to make it so that uh, you know people can make the connections that they want, can stay connected with the people that they want, can learn about um, the folks around them. And one of the things that we realized early on is that you know on the internet, when Facebook was getting started, most people didn't have a page or a blog or anything like that because most people didn't want that stuff to all be public. And there, were no, there was no tool that gave people these privacy controls that they could say, okay, I want this thing to be visible to friends, because there's no real definition of friends anywhere. Um, we want this stuff to be visible to friends of friends or people at my school, and, um, and this can be public. Uh, but this, I think, is only, should only be visible to a, an even smaller group of my friends. And um, we kind of built that in from day one, right? So now, I mean, from, from the very beginning, I mean, there were all these controls on the site so that and it started off at Harvard, and the default was that only a very small amount of the information was visible publicly, and a lot of it was visible to other Harvard <coughs> students, and some things like your contact info, which was very sensitive, was default friends only. And now, one of the challenges that we've had as we've scaled is clearly the amount of things that you can share on the site has grown dramatically. Um, some of the structures that we had in the past are no longer as applicable. Right, so we have this big school structure in, in the beginning, right, our networks. Um, now a very small percent of our users are actually in any of these networks. And we tried scaling it for a while by, you know, by doing company networks and regional networks. But then by the time you have regions like India, it's pretty useless. Um, so, um, you can argue that we just did a bad job executing on that, but I think like a geographic region doesn't have the same tightness as a school community. Um, so eventually we, we transitioned the controls to, instead of being network-based, to being friend, friend to friend, public. Um, sub friend stuff. And I actually think that's one of the things that makes Facebook work really well. I mean, even within the system that we have today, about half of our users on a monthly basis um, will share stuff in groups, right, that are smaller than just their friends. Because right? I think we're getting to a point now where, I mean, just sharing with all your friends at once, I and mean, a lot of people do that, and that's still the, the primary way that, that people are sharing. Uh, but it's, it's not the only thing that people want to do. Uh, but I mean, but again, at the same time, People are sharing so much stuff, and I think it's right, like, the stuff is sensitive, right? I mean, people clearly don't want all this stuff to be public. Some of it they do, right? And I think increasingly, um, now that people can go online and build a follower base or a subscriber base, um, for the first time in history, um, now there's a lot of reason for a lot of people to project their, their voice and, and try to communicate a lot of these things um, more broadly. Uh, but whenever we go through any transition, like, we try to deprecate networks and transition to this new kind of privacy model, it's always a very sensitive thing. And we try to do it very well. And some of the time we do it well, and some of the time we don't. And then we take people's feedback and we learn. But, um, but I actually think this is probably the thing that has made Facebook succeed.